This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Judges chapter 10 this morning in your Bibles while they're making their way back. Judges chapter 10. Judges chapter 10. We'll read the whole chapter here and then we will dive in to this story. And after Abimelech, there rose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shemir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shemir. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And he had thirty sons that rode on thirty ass colts. And they had thirty cities, which are called havath Jir, unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died, and was buried in Camon. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. Verse 7. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years, all the children of Israel that were on the other side Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is in, Ge which is in Gilead. Moreover, the children of Am Ammon passed over Jordan to fight also against Judah, and against Benjamin, and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. Verse 10. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God, and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, and from the Amorites, from the uh, children of Ammon, and from, and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the, and the Moanites, did oppress you, and ye cried unto me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me, and served other gods. Wherefore will I deliver you no more. Go, cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Verse 15. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned, do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only that we pray this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them, and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together, and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together, and encamped in Mizpah. And the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, what man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text of Scripture here this morning. And as we dive into this passage, Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to truth. Lord, we don't need to just know the stories from your word. But as you said in the New Testament, these stories are written for our example and for our learning. And Lord, we are asking and expecting you to speak to us this morning through your word. Through the example and testimony of these characters and individuals in this period of Israel, we ask that you would challenge our hearts and lives. 
We ask this in your Son's name. Amen. So we've been working through the book of Judges. And if you remember last week, we did the story of Abimelech, who was Gideon's son. And Abimelech was quite ruthless. He took over everything he could uh, as far as military might and power. He killed all of his half-brothers off to get the position and power he could with Shechem. And as the one brother who slipped out from that murderous rampage, uh, Jotham, he pronounces this parable, and it all comes true, where Abimelech has now fought with Shechem. Shechem's now fighting with him. It's just been a disaster. And if you're just trying to be just a normal person and do what's right, you're kind of caught in the middle. And you remember in part of that story where Abimelech is literally, they've gone out into their fields to go back to work, and him and his soldiers block off the city and then just slaughter everybody in the fields. That's the type of reign Abimelech has had. We've talked about here how the book of Judges is connecting us from the time of Joshua to the time of the kings, uh, and it's a very, very much a downward cyclical progression. Uh, it opened, the book opens with a failure to drive out the Canaanites, and we're in this middle section which deals with the corruption of the judges, and this sin cycle will become prominent once again in this chapter. It was kind of ignored or set aside for Abimelech, because Abimelech wasn't really a judge. He's more the aftermath of Gideon, and because Gideon had set himself up uh, as king or ruler, he kind of set, paved the way for Abimelech, and Abimelech didn't follow the pattern, but we get to see how bad decisions of Gideon lead into Abimelech, and it hurts the whole nation. The book of Judges will end, and we'll eventually get to this with the corruption of God's people and how bad it gets. So as we're doing this middle section with the corruption of the judges, we've talked about how there's this progression where they go from pretty good to all right to bad to worse. Now, I have the two judges who we have here in this chapter today under bad. And to be honest, there's not much really said bad about them. So it's not necessarily that the judges are bad. I'm not wanting to add to scripture. But this is the chapter that begins to take everything that was wrong from the previous sections in the book of Judges and wrap it up in one package and say, this is how bad things were. In fact, in Scripture, seven is usually the number of completion. Take a guess of how many nations and their idols or gods are mentioned in here in this chapter that we read of how many of those nations they went and served their gods. Seven. This chapter seems to be highlighting just a completeness in how they've turned from God. Now, again, we will dig into Tola and Jire. Um, There's some things interesting about their story, and I've left them here in the bad section because the rest of the section will be filled up with Jephthah. And boy, he is not a judge. You want any of your kids. He's not a person you're looking for a character study of, this is who I want to be like. Um, So we'll begin here, and and this is, uh, Judges 10 is really, I think it characterizes like a period in Israel's history, Uh, and Tola and Jair, they're both two judges, but they're judges who are followed by some major problems in Israel. Now, we call these two judges some of the minor judges. Now, in sports, you have the major leagues and the minor leagues, and what that means is the Big high dollar players play in the major leagues, right? And the minor leagues have all the, how do I say this, not so paid well, not so skilled players, right? Is that what we mean here when we say minor judges? These are not really good judges. Is that what we're getting at? No. When we say minor judges, all we're meaning is what we have written about them is a little bit. We don't have a lot about them. You might ask, well, why don't we have more? Surely there's stories to tell. Surely surely there's things to learn from these judges. And perhaps the writer of the book didn't necessarily know, or or maybe it didn't contribute as much to his message of the book. Remember, Judges is a message targeting how time and time again Israel fell into apostasy and served other gods, and he's painting it as a downward spiral. So possibly these were some pretty good guys. Although I think there's some hints in the text that there's problems. Um, But I think one of the reasons these judges fall in here is there were protracted periods of peace. If you read the book of Judges, it sounds like they're just under attack, under attack, under attack, under attack. Well, this book is covering several hundred years. 
And there were some periods of peace between these oppression periods. Yes, they were oppressed for you know 18 or, or 20 or even longer at a time. But it was there were these times of peace in the middle. And so uh, the, one more reason these two may be mentioned is how many judges get mentioned in the book of Judges? Including these guys, it makes a total of 12, kind of completing the whole nation of Israel. Not all 12 came, one from each tribe. Some tribes had two, which means some had none. But it's kind of this, it fits a literary theme of, hey, there's 12 tribes of Israel, there's 12 judges, kind of spread out. So let's dig into these two judges and see what we have to go here. I do want to note here as we begin, Judges 10 is setting us up for the next two judges, uh, or next two major judges in Scripture. The first one is Jephthah, which I already mentioned. He's in chapters 11 to 12, and he's going to have conflict with the Ammonites. The other judge is Samson, where this chapter sets us up for Samson, and he's going to have conflict with the Philistines. And we'll notice as we go through the chapter how those two groups kind of get highlighted. Tola and Jair, Jair um, I'm never going to say it right, and I couldn't say the Hebrew, and Jair or Jair is a horrible English mispronunciation, but I'm sorry, I'm, I don't speak Hebrew. They kind of between them and the other minor judges, Ibzon, Elon, and Abdon, they set a framework around this judge, Jephthah. Now, we're not going to get to Jephthah today. That's not the point of, of the sermon today. But they're all part of this framework, bookending the story of Jephthah, which is kind of a lengthy story. Um, and so that's kind of the framework of what's happening here. Again, these are minor judges. There's not much about them. Let's just dive right into Tola here. We read in verse 1, And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. Now it's interesting here, the word, it says he, he arose to defend Israel. I thought that odd, so I did a word search. And like, oh, that's the first time in the book of Judges that that word is used. That might be interesting. And then I realized I was searching English, not Hebrew. So I had to switch over and search the Hebrew instead of the English. And then I go, oh, wait, wait. This is the word that's continually used for save or deliver. What did the judges do? So, yes, it's the first time it gets translated in English as defend, but it's usually translated as save or to deliver, which is an interesting point. Why would a translator pick to use defend here? And I think part of the reason we don't read of an outside force attacking. We don't read of, of some army coming in at this point. He's defending Israel. Some commentators think he's actually kind of rebuilding and reestablishing Israel after the terrorist reign of Abimelech. And that could be. It could be he's picking up some of the pieces of the aftermath of Abimelech and his reign. Uh, but he is one who delivers or defends Israel. Um, his, the word Torah literally means worm or uh, smaller despised. That may have some connections um, to, to a specific worm that is on a tree, and I probably shouldn't go there to keep the sermon short, so we'll do that some other time. He's, his family line is Pua and, and Dodo, and that's just a word that kind of gets... Don't pick this chapter to name your kids, all right? There's some names in here. Just This is not the chapter to name get for naming your kids. But his dad's name, Pua, means splendid, and Dodo means like beloved or beloved. It seems by the names they have and a few other hints that they were tied in, and this group of Issachar was tied in with an industry of making like scarlet or, or linens, uh, specifically red, working with red. And that gets back to Tola's name um, and even his dad's name. They're tied in with the color red. And the way that worked was there was this worm, which Tola's name means worm, and that worm would lay its eggs on a tree branch. We don't have these here in America. They're over in the Middle East. And I don't know how to call it its scientific name, so we're just going to call it a tola. It would lay its eggs on a branch and then cover the eggs with its body. When those eggs would hatch, they would then eat the mother. And after, at, in that process, then the mother, as, as she died, would, uh, would excrete this like red dye. And it would then color these other worms red, and they'd be red the rest of their life. 
um, they would go on to live. The tree would actually have a red stain on it, and then that worm would eventually fall off and it fell to the ground. It, by that point, it would turn a very milky white color. And it may have some connections in Scripture with like Isaiah when he says, though your skins or your sins be as scarlet, they shall be... <laughs> yes, skins, that doesn't, that doesn't sound good. Uh, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. We'll see that in the ancient world, they would take these worms and they would get them on the tree branches and they would grind that up and that's what they would use to make a dye and a powder. Um, and some have connected, there, there might be here a picture of Christ in that Christ himself uh, gave his life for us. We're covered in his blood like the worms that came out and they're covered in the, in the red from the, the mother uh, worm. And then our sins are made white as snow. And I thought, it's a beautiful picture. I'm not sure the author of Judges had any of that in mind. I'm pretty sure he didn't. But nonetheless, I think Tola's probably connected in with that I industry of some point here in, in Issachar. We have a little bit about where he lived. We know he judged Israel. And that's about all we have of this guy. We don't have great conquest. We don't have great reports of what he did. There is one thing to mention, though. I have here on this the cycle and the chart here that God raises a deliverer, but does the text say that he was raised by God? So far, every other judge has been raised by God and specifically stated, but here it's just, it's, it's kind of missing. Which makes you as a reader go, huh, what's going on? To give you kind of context and where he is in a map, here's the nation of Israel, and if we zoom that map in, he's kind of more central Israel. The important thing to note is he is on the western side in the major portion of Israel. Now, they had deliverance. They had rest. It says he judged Israel for 20 and 3 years and died. I think he kind of kept the peace. He was a good administrator. We don't know. Maybe there were some stories of conquest, but we just have nothing there. The next person we have is Jair. Oh, I went backwards instead of forwards. And in verse 3 we read, and after him arose Jair, a Gileadite. Now, Gileadites are from the other side of Jordan, so they're going to be on the east side, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And he had thirty sons, and rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty cities, which are called Havasjir unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. Now, notice he is a Gileadite. His name means Jair, or Yair, means my, uh, may God enlighten. We put him, in, him on a map. We, we can see him here on the eastern side uh, and that whole kind of region. And we're pointing there to the city that he uh, is buried at. But that whole region gets named Havathjir. He seems to kind of have some dominion or rule in that area. Again, we don't know much about this, but the Bible has enough to tell us that he has 30 sons. Now pause and think. Are you going to get 30 kids from one wife? Not likely to happen. Okay, so we can assume he's either polygamist or has concubines or whatever. So it points to some of that behavior happening. But also here, what do these 30 sons ride on? Yep, 30 asses or 30 donkeys. Okay, this is kind of the equivalent of giving each of your kids a really nice car. <laughs> All right, uh, there might be something. It, it's pointing here to there's some wealth. There's a period of wealth and prosperity. Um, donkeys are also typically a symbol of peace, and, and there is um, some discussion of, of how sometimes peacemakers or keepers of the peace at this time would ride a donkey. Uh, and sometimes they're royalty, but usually we, we think of royalty as like a, a horse or something like that. But obviously he's done really well. And he's exerting some level with these 30 sons that he has, they're exerting some level of authority over these 30 different cities, and they rule this area. So to ex what extent that is, we, we don't know. And I think that these two judges, Tola and Jire, their judgeship overlaps. I mean, there are different regions in, in local areas. They're kind of overlapping here with what they're doing. But the focus of the story, oh, I'm sorry, it also says the area is called Havathjir. That means the area kind of ruled or managed or controlled the settlements of Jir, um, and that's even unto this day when it was written. He dies, and then the story shifts to the nation as a whole. 
Now, these two judges break the pattern. Up until this point, we've had this pattern of this announcement of sin, and then God responds, and then there's... These judges kind of break the pattern. It's not there at all. But after these two judges, we see the nation of Israel as a whole, and this pattern emerges again. And this pattern is going to go through them into the story of Jephthah. What happens? If we read here in chapter 10, verse 6, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Now, it's been a while since I emphasized this point, so I'm going to bring it up again. It's not simply they started stealing. And it's not simply they started you know, committing adultery or they started doing other things. The Hebrew here has, they did the evil. It's a specific evil. It's not just any evil. It's they did the evil. And what is the evil? The evil is their turning away from God to idols. And, and you can't really turn from God as your source of dependence without turning to something else. Now that something else could be yourself. That something else could be someone else. That something else could be an idol or a philosophy or an idea. It can be a lot of things. But to turn from God, you have to turn to something else. And here, Israel does the evil again. It's noted this is the most extensive list in the book of Israel's sins. And it may apply to the whole period, this whole section of time that Jael and, 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 Jair, or Jael and Tolo are reigning. It can apply to all that and all these different gods they go to worship. But here, seven different ethnic and national gods are mentioned that Israel began to worshiping. And it's interesting, what are the last two nations mentioned in this list? The Philistines are one, yes, and what's the other one? Ammonites. The next two big judges, Samson and Jephthah, those are their two big foes. So the, the problems the future faces is rooted in what's happening here in this text. God responds to this, once again, turning of evil of God's people where they turn away from him. It says, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the children of Ammon. And the, that, year they were vexed, uh, they, uh, that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years, all the children of Israel that were on the other side, Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is Gilead. So here, this expression here is very strong. He sells them, he turns them over, to their foes. And again, the Philistines would become Samson's foe, and Ammon would become Jephthah's foe. And so, uh, they're now oppressed. These other outside nations are pushing and controlling and dominating them. Uh, verse 10, we read, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. So they're oppressed, following the cycle. I, I'm not following my, my notes very well today. But at the end here, they finally respond and cry out. Well, what's interesting here is that this is also the seventh judge that's been mentioned. You have it, Othniel, Ehud, Shamga, Gar, Deborah, Gideon, Tola, Jire. Seven judges mentioned. Seven nations mentioned. Seven times they've turned to false gods. Seven times they've turned from the Lord. And how will God respond? How has God responded before? Well, we read in Judges 2, when the angel of the Lord approaches Israel and, and says to them, he says, And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And God responds here with, Why have ye done this? In Judges 6, we have a little stronger statement. In fact, it's a chiding statement. And the angel of the Lord, and he says, I, And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So early in the book, it was a question, why haven't you done this? As we get into the Gideon story, it's, you have not obeyed my voice. It's almost chiding. But this time, it's even worse. 
And we read on verse 11, And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, and from the Amorites, and from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, and the the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Moanites did oppress you. And you cried unto me, and I delivered you out of their hand. So he recites, God recites what he's done for them. They have, in verse 13, yet ye have forsaken me, and served other gods. Wherefore will I deliver you no more? So he's gone from asking them why, to chiding them, to now God says, I'm not delivering you. That's kind of a scary thing. He's reminded them of what they've, he's done. He's reminded them of what they've done. And ultimately he says, verse 14, Go cry unto the gods which ye have chosen, and let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. So here Israel has had the true God, the God who brought them out of Egypt, the God who gave them the land, gave them the conquest, the God who, every time they've blown it, he's been faithful to them. He's taken care of them. But you see, the problem is, they've gone to these other gods, but they've still kind of kept the Lord as a backup plan. He's kind of plan B, like if things don't work out. And God doesn't ever want to be your plan B. You're either allowing him to be the Lord of your life or not. And they've gone to these other gods of the other nations, and life is not going well for them. So now they come back to the Lord like, hey, fix everything. And God says, no. Go run to your other gods. If they were so good you had to leave, go to them and see how things work out. Jeremiah delivers his same message to later generations who are unfaithful Israelites, this message that um, God says, go to the, the gods that you've, you've taken. He said in Jeremiah 2, but where are thy gods that thou hast made? Let them arise, if they can save thee in a time of thy trouble, for according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. He's making mention to like every city has their own god and they do their own thing. And hey, you, you have all these things set up Contrary to my word, contrary to what I've said, you've served all these people, let them fix your problem. Similar to what Paul says in Romans. Three times in chapter 1 of Romans, God, uh, God gives the people over. This isn't the people of Israel, this is you know people in general, mankind. It says, word for God also gave them up to uncleanliness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. In verse 26, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. And in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I'm going to put it this way. Sometimes the only thing that will get someone's attention is when they experience the consequences of their sin in full force. There's no amount of warning. There's no amount of bailing out. There's no amount of, of correction that helps. You just, God has to let these people experience the consequence of their sin. Now, I think there's a distinction here. I don't think this is God actively punishing them, like adding consequences. This is, sin brings consequences as it is, and those consequences are not very enjoyable. And so sometimes what needs to happen is you need to get beat around on the hamster wheel of life to realize these decisions I'm making, they're bad and they hurt. And the only way to stop is to change. The only way to stop is to turn to the Lord instead of my own ways, my own thinking. I'm not sure it's the best method, but one technique used to get people to quit smoking was to lock them in a room, give them like two or three packs of cigarettes and have them smoke them all until they can't stand it anymore. I'm not sure that's a good idea. I'm not endorsing that. But it's, it, it has been done in the past. And in some ways, it's like until someone gets absolutely sick of their sin, or they get absolutely sick of what they're going through, they get absolutely sick of, of beat it, being beat around on the hamster wheel of life, finally they realize something's got to change. Something's got to give. And we have this temptation, even ourselves, to worship anything. And, and I should be clear here, what is worship? 
to give our attention, our dedication, our favor to something. When you enjoy something and you talk about it, you're worshiping it. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to say, I, I enjoy this product or this whatever. That, that, that's, I understand you're not setting it, necessarily setting it on a pedestal and bowing down and worshiping it. But, but let's think about it. We can very easily move into that realm very quickly of the things that we like, the things that we possess, the things that we aspire after. We can find ourselves worshiping all sorts of things, just like the children of Israel. So one commentator notes, he says, Israel's worship of neighboring gods reminds us that the people of God are often in danger of worshiping that which the world worships. And truly, when men really stop believing in God, he doesn't have anything to believe in, and he doesn't believe anything. And he can begin to believe just anything that comes down the pike. I think that's where we are as a nation, as a society, as a world today. There's no objective standard to what's true because there's no God who sits in, th in, in, in heaven who knows what's happening, who we are accountable to. So therefore, what is true is based off what I think and what you think. And then we have conflict. And we wonder why our ideals are not the same. When we worship other gods, we will value things very differently. And so here, the children of Israel, they've gone to these other gods, and God said, finally, just let them solve your problems. And probably what drives people to other gods is because they like the idea of wealth and honor. They will like the idea of, of moving forward in a certain way, getting some sort of a, an advantage or an edge. But also there's a, there's a little bit of, with false gods and with idolatry, there's a little bit of fetish practices where you're manipulating this god. You're manipulating these other individuals. And I'll tell you what, the God of the Bible won't be manipulated. He, you can't get him to do your will. You can't arm twist God. And so here, maybe there's something here in their cry to God where God is picking up and God knows that they're, they're really not repentant. They're just sorry they got their hand caught in the cookie jar. You, you know what I'm saying? Where the kid who's got his hand in the cookie jar and he gets in trouble... He's weeping and wailing and crying because he got caught and he's going to get spanking. But had he not got caught, he wouldn't be coming to confess it either. <laughs> he's just really upset that he got caught and he's experiencing the consequences of his trouble. And maybe that's what's happening here. Notice what we read in verse 15 and 16. And the children of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. This is good. They're acknowledging their sin. They're open about their sin. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. So they've acknowledged their sin, then they've laid it before the Lord and said, Lord, you just do what's right. We don't need everything fixed as it were. We, we, you, we need you to do what you seem to be good, putting God in the driver's seat as it were. Then they said, deliver us only, we pray thee this day. So they're asking for deliverance. They're, they're putting their faith and dependence back in him as their God. But it didn't stop there. They didn't make bold statements with their mouth. They at, went in verse 16 and put feet to their words. It says in verse 16, And they put away the strange gods from them and served the Lord. Now what is God's response to all this? It says his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. It hurts the heart of God to see his children hurt. When they're in pain and suffering, it hurts the heart of God. Even though they got there of their own working, their own decisions, their own failures, it still hurts the heart of God. And this is similar to what we read in 1 John 1, 9, where it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But let me warn you, we need to be careful not to tread on the grace of God. This is not a thing where oh, I can sin, I can do this, because I'll just turn around and ask for forgiveness. That type of thinking is the type of thinking that exposes you really don't understand what you're doing. You don't understand how you're violating your relationship with God. You're hurting Him. You're hurting yourself. You think God is your get-out-of-jail-free card. 
I can do what I want and not have the consequences because I'll just say a prayer and, and ask for forgiveness and it'll be okay. That's not how it works. And like James says in James 2, uh, 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Here, they've said to God, we've sinned. They've acknowledged their sin. They've said, God, you do what you think is best. You need to set things right. But please deliver us. But they didn't stop there. They actually put feet behind their words, and they did it. They, they put away the false gods. They, they did everything they knew to do to set things right. Look, it's not our works that save us. But as James said, uh, if you have faith that shows no works, it's dead. So verse 17, 18, then we read, Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. And the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. This is how the chapter ends. It may not be the best chapter division, actually. So what they've done is they've repented to the Lord. They've, they've got rid of the idols. But now they're setting up encampments to go to war because they've got to defend themselves against the Ammonites and against the Philistines. They've, they've got to defend themselves against these people coming in to take over them. And they've assembled, but they have no leader. The question, will God raise a leader. And it's interesting, the two judges, Tola and Jire, both of them it never mentions God raises them. Now I understand in one sense, like the whole book of Esther doesn't mention God, and you can see God at work. But the narrator may be making a point of something's not right here. But what followed a time of prosperity where they have 30 colts and 30 kids, and, and you, you, you can have a bunch of wives, I guess, and, and be wealthy, and you, you think that's a good idea, and then it violates, back to Genesis 1, how God designed things. The, a time of prosperity very quickly bled into a time of contempt and following other gods. As we close out here this morning, I, I want to... Have you tried to take advantage of God's forgiveness? Sometimes we can fall into the trap of thinking, well, this is not a big sin, so it's not that big of a deal with my relationship with God. Well, that's kind of treading on God's mercy, love, and grace. Or maybe you've fallen into the trap of, well, I'm just going to do that because that seems right right now, and if I'm wrong, well, just God forgive me for that. You know, we have the Holy Spirit, who's not just a thing. He's a person who wants to walk with us and guide us through life. Thus, Paul describes, the New Testament describes us as walking in the Spirit, listening to his promptings and leadings and obeying his word. And if we deliberately violate that, we can't just say a quick prayer of, Lord, forgive me, and not mean it. Now, I don't want to diminish God's forgiveness here. I want to be careful not to do that. When you or I, in all sincerity, pray and express our heart to God and ask for forgiveness, He gives it. And there is a difference between the person who in all sincerity asks for forgiveness and they sin again in the same way. And it's not that, it's not that they're trying to, but they're just, they're, they're, they, they're human. They fail. We're all human. We fail. There's a difference between that and the person who asks for forgiveness just so they can go do it again. Do you catch the difference here? There's not a deliberateness here to that that is good. Also, have you dealt with your sin? The children of Israel had gone after all other things. And here in our culture, it's easy for us to become disassociated with what's happening here in the text because we don't see the idols like a physical statue that people bow down to. But there's an awful lot of things in our culture and our society that pull at our attention, that want us to idolize them, that try to grab our, our finances and our time and our focus. And if we're not careful, we can allow those things 
to begin shaping our lives as we pursue them whether it's wealth or whether it's power or whether it's position, whether it's comfort, whether it's entertainment, whatever it is, we can begin pursuing these things, not realizing we're pursuing a false god, a false satisfaction, and we're walking away from the God who's promised to sustain us. And last question, have you allowed prosperity to lead you into that false worship? When things are going well, it's easy to forget God. The psalm uh, in Proverbs, towards the end, uh, King Lemuel prays, "Lord, feed me with that which is convenient for me. If he, if I have that too much, then I'll forget you. If I have too little, I'll curse you. Give me what I need." In Sunday school, we talked about the story of Jacob and how he's constantly trying to get more of God's blessing out by his own conniving and own working when he just needed to let God work. And I think we can let prosperity. We can let the good things. And if we're honest, we have lived in a period of, of the world and in, in our nation of prosperity. Life has been relatively good. Remember the days when you didn't have this thing called a remote and you had to go across the room and watch it to turn the TV? Some of you remember the days before indoor plumbing. Some of you remember what it was like when you had to chop every piece of wood to heat your house. And yes, I've, I remember that. <laughs> We've lived in some really comfortable times. And while walking through comfortable times and having prosperity, it's easy to forget God. Until I was preparing this, I didn't make the connection between these two things in my mind. But I got an email this week. Um, and it was just an email from, from a publisher I'd bought some CDs from with a, a hymn history, as it were, of, of not a hymn, but a song that was written. And the song's titled, The Snare of Prosperity. And the author writes, I was drawn to highlight this song, as it seems perhaps as, as a nation, we've been caught in the snare. Where we sit today certainly feels like we have, and the growing empty seats in our churches seem even greater evidence of this. In Hosea 13, God offered these words to his people. When they had pasture, they were filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, they forgot me. About 18 years ago, when I began setting up and decorating my first home, a small yet adequate eightplex townhome, complete with three total windows, a strange sense of abundance began sweeping over me. My husband and I had stored up enough to make this many purchase this possible this purchase possible we had bought a new upright piano to which i still love a couch and love seat with an end tables and big bookshelves a good bit of thrift store items for do it yourself projects and multiple uh, or a multitude of wall hanging decorations throw pillows and so forth god was good he had provided all these things yet danger was lurking these things had and have a strong pull to tie my heart to this earth. Worse, they can cause it to become indifferent towards God. It was during this time that the lyrics to the song, The Snare of Prosperity, began to spill out. I don't always do this, but I'm going to play the song. It'll be on the screen and you can see the words because it will be a bit unfamiliar, I suppose. But think through the story of judges with how they've had this period of prosperity and then they fall into sin because they forget God. I think we're in the same dangerous spot to do the same. <laughs> Snare to me, I know, Lord, that in peace. 
peace and security temptation are with me there to forget you, to forget the one from whom all blessings flow. To neglect you, to neglect the one to whom my love I owe. To forsake you, to forsake the one who is the giver of all, but not prosperity. So easily distract me from devotion, from devotion to you. As I daily feast on food from my table, as I shelter myself in a home strong and stable, as I work with the strength that God has enabled, I'm reminded, so soon reminded, that in a land that flowed with milk and honey in a time that was free, was free from hostility when harvest fields would yield the plenty. It was then God's people went astray. And they forgot you. They forgot the one from whom all blessings flow. They ignored you. They ignored the one to whom their love they owed. They forsook you. They forsook the one who is the giver of all. They left prosperity so easily distract them from devotion, from devotion to you. My mind and my heart Let me guard so attentively For no human soul Can possess double loyalty I live for God Or I live for money Let me thank you Lord For every blessing Let me loosely hold To every possession Let me purpose in my soul That my one and only passion Is to know you To love the one to whom my love I owe. I want to know you. I want to know the one who is the giver of all. Let not prosperity so easily distract me from devotion, from devotion, from devotion, devotion. Ooh. it's of the Lord that that email was sent this week. I think God has a way of working those things out. And when I listened to that song again, I've heard it a hundred times, I thought that just fits the story we have here. So we close out here this morning. I think you get the point. Prosperity can be a temptation for us to become like Israel and to serve other gods. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. In the example here of Israel, although it's a negative example, it's an example we don't want to emulate, we don't want to be like, but we're thankful there's hope. That when we, with hearts of sincerity, turn to you in humility, that you grieve with us, you grieve over the state we're in. But Father, would we be careful? Would we be oh so careful? that we don't become deliberately abusive of your mercy, love, and grace? Would we not fall into the trap of, of viewing you as a get-out-of-jail-free card? But rather, would we desire to lay our lives down to serve you? And as we walk in a land that truly has been blessed, 
Lord, would we not forget that you're the one who's blessed us with all good things. This week, keep our eyes fixed on you. And may the pleasures and comforts of this life not serve as a distraction, but rather would they serve what comforts, what pleasures we have as reminders of how good you are. And when need be, would we be willing to lay those comforts, lay those pleasures and the enjoyment and the good things of life, would we lay them down when necessary for your cause? Whether it's to sacrifice for something, whether it's to do the right thing, regardless of of what others are saying, would we be willing to lay our comforts and our preferences and our prosperity aside so that we may, may remain faithful to you? May we not get distracted as Israel was distracted. This week, keep our eyes fixed on you, our hearts longing after you, and may we be devoted to you. We ask this in your Son's name. Amen.